Hello there friends, it's Jim O'Rear. Thanks for joining me for another video. And on today's video, I thought I would do another little segment of reality versus uh, fiction. And um, if you've been watching some of these videos, you know that I, I, I wrote a book uh, several years ago that came out in stores called Hollywood Paranormal Films Fact and Fiction. And what the book does is it takes uh, real cases, true life cases of hauntings and uh, uh, monsters like Mothman and stuff like that, and compares those cases to the movies based on them. And I kind of point out uh, what really happened in the real story as opposed to what Hollywood wants you to believe happened. So in today's video, we are going to talk about Dracula. And I, I know uh, Dracula walks a fine line if it's paranormal or not but it is uh, a great example of um, someone taking a real life case and making something fantastical out of it. Now, I, I'm a, a big fan of Bram Stoker's novel. He, he wrote the novel back in the 1800s and um, it just, I've, I've been fascinated with it all my life. So it, it should be no surprise that I love the movies based on Dracula. And my two favorites, are the 1931 version with Bela Lugosi and the 1992 version with uh, Gary Oldman. And I, I think um, the two of those combined with Stoker's novel really combines a lot of the uh, real life elements with the fantastical and uh, kind of uh, shows you how this, uh, this Dracula that we know now was created. So let's take a look at the real case versus the, uh, the Hollywood version of the case. I'm assuming that everyone watching this video is familiar with some form of the Dracula movies, but for those that need a reminder, here's a quick recap. The tale begins with Jonathan Harker, a newly qualified English solicitor that's journeying by train and carriage from England to Count Dracula's crumbling remote castle on the border of Transylvania. The purpose of his visit is to provide legal support to Dracula for a real estate transaction overseen by Harker's employer. At first seduced by Dracula's gracious manner, Harker soon discovers that he has become a prisoner in the castle. He also begins to see disquieting facets of Dracula's nocturnal life. Dracula eventually makes his way to England where he begins to menace and woo Harker's fiance Mina and her vivacious friend Lucy. It's not long before Lucy begins to suspiciously waste away and the help of Professor Abraham von Helsing is called upon. Von Helsing discovers the cause of Lucy's condition, vampirism, and performs multiple transfusions in an attempt to save her. Lucy eventually dies and rises again to stalk the villagers, causing von Helsing to track her down, drive a stake through her heart, and behead her. Around the same time, Jonathan escapes from the castle and returns home, marrying Mina and joining Von Helsing's crusade to destroy Dracula. After Dracula learns of Von Helsing's plot, he takes revenge by biting Mina several times and infecting her with the vampire's curse. He then flees back to his castle in Transylvania, followed by Von Helsing's group, who manage to track him down just before sundown and stab him to death in the heart, freeing Mina from his spell. Before writing Dracula, Bram Stoker spent seven years researching European folklore and stories of vampires. He borrowed several things he had learned about an aristocratic Transylvanian prince known as Vlad the Impaler to help create the story of Dracula. Vlad, who ruled the territories that now constitute Romania, was born in 1431. He came from a native ruling family. Very little is known of Vlad's father's early life beyond the fact that he was born sometime before 1395. He was also named Vlad and was called Dracul due to his affiliation with the Order of the Dragon, dedicated to fighting Turks. People at large who were unfamiliar with Vlad's association in the Draconis Order, seeing a dragon on his shield, referred to him as Dracul, meaning dragon or devil. His son, of course, inherited his name, Vlad, and became known as Dracula, the A being added to the end to denote son of the devil. Vlad was very much the byproduct of the Europe of his day, the Renaissance, a period of transition. One of the most terrifying inventions associated with this time period was that of gunpowder. It revolutionized warfare by making killing much easier. From the Renaissance period forward, wars involved paid professionals who had little or no concern for the sanctity of human life. 
They were taught to kill, not maim. No distinction between civilians and soldiers was to be made. In addition to warfare, the Black Plague was running rampant and continued to ravage Europe. The brevity of life during this time helps to explain the cruelty and low regard for human life exhibited by Dracula. There's an ominous side note to this that could have easily been dismissed as a child's harmless curiosity were it not for Dracula's future reputation for impaling. He showed, at an early stage in life, a morbid curiosity in watching from his first floor bedroom criminals being led from the jail to a place of execution by hanging. The early impressionable years of Dracula's childhood were dominated by lowly midwives and wet nurses. They were in charge of drilling into his mind the lesson that he and his brothers were different from ordinary mortals and, depending upon the fates, might be destined to hold an exalted station in life. Both formal education and accidents of politics were responsible for molding Dracula's complex personality. At age 11, Dracula and his younger brother Radu were turned over to the Turks as prisoners by their father as an effort to maintain peace in his country. This further cemented in Dracula's mind that life was cheap, especially when you couldn't even trust your own father. For the next six years, they would live as prisoners, with the duress toughening Dracula's character and making him hard. When Dracula's father was killed in battle, he was set free. His Turkish masters told him that they considered him a candidate for his father's throne and made him an officer in the Turkish army. When Kazan, Dracul's former chancellor, eventually gave Vlad a detailed account of his father's brutal slaying and news of his brother being buried alive, Dracula took an oath that he would not rest until he had avenged these crimes and killed Vladislav, the man responsible in person. The first opportunity presented itself when Dracula was 17 years old. Over the course of three mid-October days, a large battle took place that resulted in a serious defeat for the Hungarian army led by Vladislav. Given this decline in power and prestige, Dracula was able to make his first major move towards seizing the throne. Dracula realized that he could only stay on the throne so long and the Turks were in control of the situation. But after achieving victory in battle, valuable time was lost burying the dead instead of advancing towards the enemies. Vladislav managed to escape capture during battle and remove Dracula from the throne only two months after his rule. Dracula went into hiding, using help from his many political contacts, and worked his way back up through the ranks. By mid-July 1456, at a time when the Turks and Hungarian forces were locked in battle at Belgrade, Dracula engaged Vladislav in combat. Dracula had the satisfaction of killing his enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat. By August, at the age of 25, Dracula was back on the throne as prince. In Dracula's quest for power, one of the central issues he posed was his relationship to the boyar class. Power had always been shared between princes and boyars. Given the brevity of individuals' reigns, political sovereignty tilted heavily in the favor of the boyars, who were, up until Dracula's time, encroaching upon the authority of the prince. Dracula decided to cripple the boyar monopoly. In addition, there were still partisans of Vladislav hiding on their estates who needed to be destroyed down to their last male heir, no matter how young. So the stage was set for a massive and hostile purge. Castle Dracula, located to the north of the city, was where he contrived his plan to crush the power of nobility, centralize the administration of the state, and create a military force loyal only to himself, purging the boyars by impalement. Dracula's plan was put into motion during the spring of 1457 while the boyars were attending Easter celebrations at the palace. When Easter Day arrived, and while all of the citizens were feasting and dancing, Dracula's men surrounded them, led them together with their wives and children, and impaled them outside the city walls. This episode helped to establish Dracula's reputation for cruelty and earned him the nickname of the Impaler. Much like the character Dracula played by Gary Oldman in the 1992 version of the story, the real Dracula was no longer concerned with proper diplomacy. Dracula was not purely evil, however. He did a lot for the villages he ruled over. Dracula was conscious of the fact that peasants constituted over 90% of the total inhabitants of the country. He needed their brawn to cut down forests and create farmable land. To encourage these efforts, Dracula granted villagers on the plain exemptions from feudal dues, and in other instances, he founded new villages. He rewarded hard work, punished laziness, and developed a more secure society. The people of his land realized that Dracula's hardened nature accounted for both his good works and his acts of terror. Dracula wished to create a new system of ethics in his country, laying emphasis on personal morality. He hated evil in his land. If someone lied or committed some type of injustice, 
He was not likely to stay alive, whether he was a nobleman, priest, monk, or common man. One example of his puritanical side is that if any wife had an affair outside of marriage, Dracula ordered her sexual organs to be cut. She would then be skinned alive and exposed in her skinless flesh in the public square, her skin hanging separately from a pole in the middle of the marketplace. The same punishment was applied to maidens who did not keep their virginity and to unchaste widows. Some of this sexual deviation is strongly hinted at through various scenes in Dracula, especially the 1992 version. Regardless of motivation, these savage acts are hallmarks of Dracula's reign and play heavily in the tone and certain scenes of the films based on the fictional character of the same name. What shocks one is the number of victims Dracula amassed within a short span of his six-year rule. Estimates range from 40,000 to 100,000, a calculation made by the Bishop of Erlo near the end of Dracula's career. It was another sign of Dracula's bloodlust, also a major part of the films, an insatiable inner drive to kill. Not all of Dracula's victims were pierced from the buttocks up with impalement, however. Many were also impaled through the heart, another action reflected upon heavily in the Dracula movies, also in their navel, stomachs, or chest. Of course, there were many other forms of punishment. Dracula decapitated heads and cut off noses, ears, sexual organs, limbs. He blinded, strangled, hanged, burned, boiled, skinned, roasted, hackled, nailed, buried alive, and stabbed victims. In addition, he would occasionally expose victims to the elements or to wild animals. Dracula's demented reign of terror had simply lasted too long. His people and his army melted away, causing Dracula to flee Transylvania for help from the king. Dracula found no support. Instead, what he found was a plot to have him arrested. He was imprisoned and his actions were examined by the courts for 12 years before it was determined that he was not guilty of any crimes. Dracula was returned to his throne for a third reign. It's believed that Dracula was killed by a hired assassin from a Turkish camp in 1476. The Turks wished to have vengeance against the one that had been against them for so long. They hired a Turk to act as one of Dracula's servants with the secret mission of killing him. The Turk was instructed to cut off his head and bring it back on horseback to the Sultan. Dracula's head was later exposed on a high stake at Constantinople for the populace to witness. It is reported that after Dracula's body was buried, it disappeared giving Stoker another paranormal tie-in to Vlad rising from the grave as one of the undead. So as you can see, the real life case of Dracula is really just as fascinating as the fictional character that is loosely based on him. Uh, it, it's a, uh, I don't know, the, it, between Stoker and the filmmakers, uh, they really created a story that is, uh, it's historical, and horrific and romantic all at the same time. And uh, that's, that's not an easy feat for a writer. So it's, 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 great, uh, it's great history, it's great storytelling, it's great filmmaking to, to bring this character and, and all the elements of this historical case made fantastical to life. So I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you have, just click on the little like button there to like the video. And then also click on the subscribe button and uh, you will be notified of when more videos will pop up on this channel. Usually every three to four days or so is, is when, uh, when I'll do one. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time.